or tape, CDs, DVDs, or our publication, Voices from His Excellent Glory, Declaring the Kingdom, write P.O. Box 21516, Hot Springs, Arkansas, Zip 71903. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are hundreds of free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Monday morning, May, uh, May the 27th, 1991. Memorial Weekend Teaching and Deliverance Camp Meeting being held at Lake Hamilton Bible Campgrounds, Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas. This is the uh, final service of the uh, uh, weekend of teaching and deliverance uh, here at Lake Hamilton Bible Campgrounds, and uh, Walter Fletcher is the speaker of the morning. Well, it's always hard to come down to the last service and the last goodbye, but that's what it comes down to every time, and we, but we don't have to forget. We can remember the joy of the Lord and the blessing of the Lord, and we can rejoice in that tomorrow and the next day and the next day, and the joy of the Lord can be ours when we're not here, wherever we are and whatever circumstance we're in. It's necessary that we learn to live in the presence and the joy of the Lord, because everything isn't always like this, and you know it's not, and I know it's not, so we have to learn to be able to become an overcomer. We are becoming overcomers, and we have to be able to do that in every circumstance of our life and make Jesus Lord and put him first, and therefore if we do that, then we'll not have problems as bad as with the things about us as we would have if we don't make Jesus Lord of our lives. And making him Lord, then we have to determine that he will be Lord. Amen. It's been a privilege to have the Fletchers with us, and the Canadas, and the Cooks, and, and uh, Bill Goodson, and Linda, and all the rest of those who have helped us, Bill, and uh, have helped us here with the uh, praise and the worship and the teaching. And, and uh, we just appreciate all of you and all of your efforts that you've given and Brother Walter Fletcher is going to come and conclude this morning the series of camp meeting, meetings. Not wanting to leave. <laughs> Some places you're ready to leave by the end of the... <laughs> but uh, I, I, I really do mean that, and we just really have a special love in our hearts for Glenn and Irma, and uh, we'll just adopt them as our our spiritual parents and and uh, real friends in the Lord, and uh, uh, maybe if you speak a kind word, they might have us back <laughs> at some point in time. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And uh, I just I just really so sense here that uh, God really has His hand on this place for uh, be a real catalyst for revival across this nation. Of course, we know many other places around the world are blessed through the ministry and the tape ministry and other things that go out from here. But uh, uh, this is one of God's real special places, I believe, in, in, in the nation. Can you say amen? Let's uh, go in our Bible, please, to the uh, Gospel of Mark. <clears throat> Mark's Gospel. Actually, it was Peter's Gospel given to Mark. You know that? Mark actually wrote this down. History tells us from Peter account. And uh, so we have this particular account here before us. Uh, Mark 11, 1 through 10, please. Mark 11, 1 through 10. Is everyone there? And as they approached Jerusalem at Bethage and Bethany near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a coat tied there, on which no one yet has ever sat. Untie it and bring it here. And if anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? <clears throat> you say the Lord has need of it. Immediately he will send it back here. They went away and found a coat tied at the door outside in the street, and they untied it. Some of the bystanders were saying to them, What are you doing untying the coat? They spoke to them just as Jesus had told them, and they gave them permission. 
And he brought the coat to Jesus and put their garments on it, and he sat upon it. Many spread their garments in the road, and others spread leafy branches, which they had cut from the fields. Those who went before and those who were following after were crying out, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. Lord Jesus, we come this morning. Lord, we put no confidence in our flesh. Father, we know that flesh will never get us anywhere but the grave. That which is of the flesh will only produce flesh. Father, we ask that you'll quicken us this morning. That you'll life us, Lord God. That you'll give us a word of life. The words that you speak, Lord, their spirit and their life. Father, that you'll give us something to go away with here this morning. Jesus, we ask that you'll just use us for your glory and your honor. Lord, that you'll give us worthy hearts and ears to hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying to the church, and in particular, this people, that you've gathered them for such a time as this. We magnify you, Lord. For in the heart and bosom of God, you destined that this camp, this place, these facilities, that Glenn and Irma, Lord God, should come and do something of import, have an impact for eternity, Lord God. Lord, we bless you for sharing that with us and with these, your people. Father, we don't want to take it lightly. We count it as a real stewardship and trust, Lord that you've allowed us to be here at this time. And Father, we ask that you'll make, Lord God, this time count for eternity as we go back to our communities, as we go back to our assemblies, as we go back among the people that you've planted us, Lord God. Father, we ask that the things that you've given us will prove to be a seed that brings forth thirtyfold, sixtyfold, a hundredfold for the glory of God. Jesus, we ask that you deliver us this morning of every religious spirit. Lord, that we won't go back and play the old religious record player. Father, that there'll be something deep within us that's been written upon our hearts. We thank you that we are living epistles. We read of all men. Make us open books, O oh God. All men, Lord God, can see. Father, make the vision plain in our heart that even those who run <laughs> can see it. Oh, Father, we ask in the name of Jesus, by your Holy Spirit, out of the chaos and the void and the vacuum and the dark places, Lord God, you've spoken some things into existence, Father. And we ask, O oh God, that you'll call that light and illumination and understanding and the sense of liberty and freshness not leave us, Lord God, as we leave this camp meeting. Father, we take it with us. We be able to say to those who have not, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Lift our vision higher, Lord, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to talk to you this morning as we wrap this up, speak to each and every one of our hearts about the joy of full surrender. The joy of full surrender. So we're all familiar with this particular portion, Mark's Gospel. Jesus is preparing now to go the way of Calvary. He set his face like a flint to accomplish the will of the Father. Hebrews gives us a little insight into that determination. It tells us that with strong crying and tears, made supplication unto God, and he was heard because of his piety. He learned obedience to the things which he suffered. The Living Bible perhaps gives one of the best explanations. The writer to Hebrews, who I believe was Paul, is not trying to explain all of Jesus' prayer life. He's really talking in particular about that great conflict in the Garden of Gethsemane. And with strong crying and tears, he made a supplication unto God. Not in order that he might escape what was coming, because he'd come into the world to... For this very cause. See, you and I come into the world to live. He came into the world to die. And uh, the Living Bible tells us that he prayed with strong crying and tears to such an extent that the, the, the sweat 
the, the blood came out of his pores like great drops of sweat. He prayed with such intensity to do the will of God that he might not die a premature death there in the Garden of Gethsemane. I wonder, have any of us striven in that manner that we might fully accomplish the will of God in our hearts and lives? He prayed with such great agony that he might not die a premature death because he wasn't to die in the garden. He was to die on Calvary's cross for you and I. What a picture. Anyway, as Jesus is, is approaching Jerusalem to become the sacrificial lamb, the paschal lamb, he says unto his disciples here, I want you to go into the village opposite you and I immediately... As you enter it, you're going to find a coat. I want to talk to you not so much about the disciples. I want to look at this little lowly figure of a beast because it speaks to you and I today. What I'd like to talk about is the joy of full surrender. Or, if you like, the coat upon which Jesus rode. God often communicates to you and I the truths of the kingdom in such simple terms that if we have an ear to hear and a willing heart to understand, He can speak to us. And he speaks through His natural creation to show us things of the kingdom. And uh, here we find this animal, this coat, is to be this instrument of instruction, I believe, for us as to something of the kingdom, life that God wants each and every one of us to experience. God uses things. Did you know that? 1 Corinthians says God uses small things. God uses those things which are not. God uses weak things. God uses things that he might confound those things that are mighty and those things that are wise, those things which the world counts as of importance. God counts them as of no importance. And if you and I would be willing before God to be of no account, then God can use us for some account for His glory. Amen? I mean, you know the way up is down. Amen? And Jesus said, if you want to be great in my kingdom, He didn't say you've got to start off being a servant. He said you must be a servant. Amen? And I believe we need to retain the purposes of God and have servants hearts and attitudes. You see, one of the greatest untapped powers in the kingdom of God is servant power. Amen. Servant power. So anyway, as we consider this, Jesus uses an animal from the animal kingdom. Earlier he talked about simple things, small things. He talked about the birds of the air. He talked about the sparrows, though they were insignificant. Birds, your father knows them, each one by number. And uh, here he uses this coat. If you, if you go with me over into Isaiah, you'll see just another instant where God uses the, the animal kingdom to speak a kingdom truth to his people. Isaiah 1 and verse 3. An ox knows its owner, and a donkey its master's manger. But Israel does not know my people do not understand. Now get this picture. God says an ox knows its owner and a donkey its master's crib. How do they know it? Just by instinct. <laughs> All right? They know it by instinct. These are just, uh, by, by instinct, these creatures know how to find the ox knows its owner and the donkey knows how to get back to its master's crib. But he said, my people do not know my people do not understand. What they didn't know and what they didn't understand was God. They didn't have a relationship to God. You read this particular portion in Isaiah, they were doing all the stuff. Please listen to me this morning. They were doing all the stuff, and yet they didn't know God. And God says, to, to make a contrast, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step down and show you a, a principle, even in the animal kingdom, an ox knows its owner. And a donkey knows how to get back to his master's crib, but my people don't know, my people don't understand me. 
And I believe in this hour, beloved, that the cry of the heart of the Father God is to have a people that relate to Him. Relationship is what God is after in this hour. You can do all the stuff and, near, and still not come near to God. Hello. Uh, and, and, and God forbid that we should all go away from here and say, My, didn't we see some good stuff? Didn't God do the stuff? Amen. Uh, uh, and never realize that what God did in doing the stuff was to draw us near to Him. Amen. And we don't want to be, I mean, we want to be wiser than the ox and the donkey, <laughs> who just by sheer instinct, the ox knows how to, who his owner is, and just by sheer instinct, the donkey knows how to get back to his master's crib. Do we know how to get back to God? <laughs> Amen? And do we know who, who our master and owner is? Amen? Somebody said, don't shout me down. <laughs> Come on. I want to talk to you about this coat. It speaks to me of the joy of full surrender. And I believe this is what God is asking of each and every one of us in this hour. Because full sur surrender is not a kill joy. Full surrender to God should not be something that, like, you know, going to the dentist to get our teeth pulled. Somebody said one time they saw some people coming out of church and they sure they've been to the dentist. Right? I mean, you know, when we come to, the, come to the house of the Lord, if it is finished, it ought to be, somebody said, if it's finished, it ought to be party time. Amen? If the work has been done on Calvary, we ought to be celebrating the victory. Amen? But the joy of full surrender is something I believe God wants from each and every one of us. And uh, the first thing I'd like to share with you about this cult, Jesus says to them in verse 4 that... Uh, they would find this coat tied at the door. They would find this coat tied at the door. It was outside. It wasn't encumbered. It wasn't inside of the house. You'll have to understand culturally in that day that they would often build a house and build a compartment to keep their animals and keep their, their beasts by compartment right inside of the house. But Jesus says, you're going to know that this is the coat that I want to use because it's going to be at the door. It's going to be outside. It's going to be in a place of readiness. A place of readiness. You're not going to have to wonder if, it's, if, 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 if there are four or five other coats that this one could possibly be it. This coat is going to be at the door. It's going to be in a place of readiness. And I believe that God is looking for people who are not encumbered in their lives, who are not shut up in their lives, who are not shut up with their past and, and, and things that so encumber them that they cannot be used of God in this hour. But God is looking for a people who say, Lord, here is my life. I am standing in a place. I am at the door. I am ready to hear. How many of you know in Revelation 20, that's what it's all about? We quote that in terms of salvation, but it's not about salvation. Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door not. How many know he's trying to get into the church? He's trying to get into his own church. And they're having church and they're doing everything and he wasn't in it. And he's standing outside the door waiting to get in. And I believe that Jesus stands at the door of each and every one of our lives. He's coming across this nation again as he's never done before. And he is knocking at his church saying, I want to come in. I want to fellowship. I want to suck with my people. I want to transform them. I want to do something that they haven't seen done in this generation. But we're going to have to be a people like that coat who are at the door and at a place of readiness. When he comes, we can say like Isaiah, hear my Lord, send me. Jesus goes on to say, uh, later on in, in Mark chapter 13, he brings up this point again. Mark 13 and 33. Take heed, keep on the alert, for you do not know when the appointed time is. It is like a man away on a journey, who upon leaving his house, putting his slaves or servants in charge, assigning to each one his task. Each of you have a task here. God has not caused you to be an accident going somewhere to happen. But God has laid a hold of your life and put his hand on your life because he's giving a task that only you can do. And Jesus said to this, this owner of the house, he gave each a task, also commanded the doorkeeper to stay on the alert. Therefore, he says, be on the alert, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming, whether it's in the evening or at midnight or at the cock crowing or in the morning, lest he come suddenly and you be found asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all... Be on the alert. We need to be in a place of readiness in this hour. 
because the joy of full surrender is when the master calls. I say, hear my Lord, I hear your voice, and I'm ready to follow. Amen? And this coat was to be found in a place of readiness. Not only that, we discover in verse 4, he said, you're going to find this coat not only tied at the door, this place of readiness, but it's going to be outside in the streets. It's going to be out in the street. Now, there's very something very, very unusual about this. If you have the King James translation, it says that this coat is in the place of where two paths meet. The place where two paths meet. I want you to see a picture of this. No owner of a coat, uh, uh, in one sense of the word, would put a, a, an animal, this beast of burden, or this, this particular uh, coat, would put it in a place outside in the street. It was a very valuable instrument. It never been ridden on. And there's a lot of uh, question as to whether Jesus had a word of knowledge that this coat was be in this certain place. I don't personally believe that. You read here in verse 1, it talks about him approaching Jerusalem. He's not there yet. He's at Bethage and Bethany. And we know that Jesus had two, two friends there in Bethany. One was Lazarus, whom he raised from the dead, Mary and Martha. And he often spent time there in Bethany. The people loved him. They packed it out when they gave Jesus a feast. In, 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 in honor of him. Jesus also cleansed Simon the leper, who also was from Bethany. I personally believe that Jesus probably had had some fellowship with them, and perhaps they'd taken him around, or whatever the case might be, and uh, he might have spied this coat, and discovered this coat which had never been ridden on. Now, we know that as a part of the prophetic word of God that he was going to ride upon this coat, but I believe that perhaps Jesus, just in the course of his, his uh, fellowship and friendship, with, these, uh, with uh, the owner, perhaps he, he said, I'd like to use that coat. They said, oh, Jesus, whatever you want. You just tell me when you want it, and I'll have it ready for you. And uh, uh, I believe that on that particular day, Jesus told them where to put the coat. Now, that's what I believe about that. <laughs> if you want to believe something else, that's all right. It won't take away from the point I want to make. This coat was at the door, but it was outside in the street. It was in a place where two has meat. In other words, it was in a very conspicuous place where the two paths meet outside in the street. In other words, it was in a place where those who came upon this coat had to go one direction or the other, but they could not uh, ignore the coat. They could not ignore the coat. They couldn't go on with the routine of their business and their lives as usual because this coat was in a place where two paths meet. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And I believe that that coat speaks of you and I. When we understand that joy of full surrender, that God will put us in a place of conspicuousness. God will put us in a place where the world will have to reckon with God's people. Now, let me share with you. I'll, I'll back that up with some scripture here. I want you to see this principle. It really astounded me when the Lord shared this with me. Go with me to Proverbs and the first chapter. Proverbs chapter 1. I believe it speaks to a people who have to be reckoned with. I believe it speaks of a people who are going to cause those who are indifferent and those who have been undecided and those who have been in a place of casualness. They will have to make a decision what they're going to do. Proverbs 1, verse 20, wisdom shouts in the streets. She lifts her voice in the square. At the head of the noisy streets, come on, she cries out. And at the entrance of the gates of the city, she utters her saying. You know, the entrance of the gate of the city was where they did their business. That was the coming and the going and the trafficking and the business and the selling and the buying and all of these type of things. It was where we would say the commerce of life took place. And wisdom doesn't take her stand somewhere on a back alley or somewhere in a corner. Even Paul, when he stood before greater King Agrippa, he says the things which we have done were not done in a corner. Come on. They weren't done in a dark place. He even appealed to Agrippa. He says, you've known about these things. And here wisdom takes her place right in the very heart of the center, if you please, of where the busyness of life and the cares of life and the worries of life and the things of life are taking place. Are you out there? And it says here that wisdom, she lifts her voice. She's going to be heard. Come on. She lifts her voice above the noise of the streets, above the noise of the busyness and the going and the coming. And at the entrance of the gates in the city, she utters her saying, saying, How long, O nine Eve, not ones, will you love simplicity? 
and scoffers delight themselves in scoffing. How many of you know we've got scoffers in this hour? We've got mockers in this hour. We've got those because they've seen the, the church seemingly on, the, on the, the downward side of things, and there are mockers and scoffers which have come in the church. But here wisdom lifts her voice once again. She's going to be heard. She says, How long, O fools, will you hate knowledge? Notice this. She calls them to repentance. Verse 23, Turn to my reproof. What's going to happen? Behold, I will pour my spirit out on you. How many know that's what God wants to do in this hour? I will pour out my spirit on you. I will make my words known to you. God says his, he's going to pour out his spirit. Brother Tommy touched this verse out last night. He's going to pour out his spirit and he is going to make his words known unto you. I tell you, beloved, when we get into a place of full surrender, it isn't hard to hear the, the voice of the Lord. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and another they'll not follow. And I believe when we get to a place of full surrender and we get to a place where we say, Lord, I'm willing to be used. I'm ready to be used of you. I'm willing to be that, like, that, like that, that donkey of a colt, if you please. I'm willing to be a fool for Jesus. We'll begin to see the power of God come upon us once again. Come on. And we'll begin to hear the word of the Lord once again like we've longed to hear it in this hour. You'll go over to Proverbs and 8 and we see the same principle here. Does not wisdom call and understanding again lift her voice? Where does she do it? On the top of the heights beside the way where the paths meet. She takes her stand beside the gates at the opening of the city. At the entrance of the door she cries out saying, O men, I call and my voice is to the sons of men. And I want you to know God's looking for some voices in this hour. How you know, how many of you know that most of us are just echoes? We're just parroting what others have said. We're parroting what others have, have told us. But we've not got a word from God. John the Baptist did not describe himself as the voice. He described himself as a voice. And I believe God is looking for voices. What are voices? Well, I believe those who are like uh, 1 Corinthians that says, if the trumpet gives an uncertain sound, who's going to prepare for battle? But how many of you know that God wants to give those who can lift their voice like a trumpet and be heard in this hour? The place where two paths meet. And we're going to be able to say to those who are just coming and going and haven't made a decision, you're going to have to decide which way you're going to go. Because the broad road, if you choose the broad road and the wide road, is going to lead to death and destruction. But straight is the way that leads to life eternal. And I believe as we stand there and men have to reckon with God and hear the voice of God and the power and the Spirit of God begin to be displayed, we're going to be pointing people either to heaven or to hell, either to the purposes of God, or they're going to go down the broad road on into corruption and destruction destruction in their life. But there's no longer going to be this sense of indifference and, and that Jesus can be take me or leave me kind of attitude. Amen. Amen? Amen? Oh, I tell you, this to me excites me. You see, there's a poem that says to every man, there is a way and there is the way and then there are ways. And the high man chooses the highway and the low man chooses the low. And on the misty flat in between, the rest run to and fro. But to every man, there is a way and the way, and whichever way you choose, that's the way your soul will go. And you see, it's an hour of commitment, and we've got to make up our mind which way we're going in this hour. Are we on the high road? Hmm? The high road, is it true of you, you can say, that uh, I'm to the highlands bound, I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day? Come on, still pressing on? As I upward bound, Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Amen? We want to be a people who are going higher and higher in God in this hour. But we're going to have to make a, a decision. We're going to have to make a commitment which way our soul will go. Well, look with me to Mark 11 again. Not only is this coat tied at the door, it's outside in the street. What did Jesus say to the disciples? When you find this coat, what? Verse 4. Loosen. Loosen. How many of you know that has to happen? If this coat is going to experience the joy of full surrender, the joy of being fully used of the Lord, Jesus doesn't really say you're going to find the coat out there. He said, loosen. Loosen. And don't you know that's what Jesus has been speaking to us here at this camp? Amen. We've discovered that Jesus has come and said, loosen and let him go. Loosen and let him go. And set him free. 
And Jesus Christ came into the world that you and I might experience the freedom and the deliverance and the glory of God in our lives. And he comes to each and every one of them and says, yes, I want to use you. I see you're at a place of attention to me. I see that you're willing to be a fool for my sake if need be. But I've got to loose you from some things if I'm going to use you in this hour. Hallelujah. And how does he loose us? Well, he looses us in several ways. One of the ways I'm thinking in particular, Jesus said unto those who believed, John 8, said unto those who believed, if you continue in my word. Then are you my disciples, and then you're going to know the truth, and the truth shall, come on, set you free. Amen? And we're going to have to have truth in this hour, beloved. We need to know and experience the power of God to bring deliverance as we've experienced in our heart and life. But I tell you, if you do not fill your life with the Word of God, you will be bound again. And you'll find the enemy come in again. And if you leave that, that door open in your life and you leave that, he'll come in again through the back door, through circumstance. You've got to fill your heart and mind with the Word of God and the truth of God. Amen? He's come to set us free. He said, loose him when you find him. But then there's an aspect that I think most of us miss. And when I talk about the joy of full surrender, I think most of us miss this one. Not only is there a sense where this coat had to be loosed, had to be set free, but it had to be released from all of the claims. It had to be released from all of the claims. Now watch this, verse 5. Jesus had already told them that when you find this coat, if somebody says, what, you're, what, you're, what are you doing loosening it? Say to them, the Lord has need of it. Verse 5. And the bystanders were saying to them, what are you doing untying the coat? And they spoke to them just as Jesus had told them. Not only did this coat need to be loosed from that which had bound it. Come on. The anointing breaks the yoke. Amen. He sent the disciples to loose this coat. And you and I have been sent to loose others in Jesus' name. Now watch this. In John 11, Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, but he told the saints, Loose him and let him go. How many of you believe that oftentimes the problem in the church is that Jesus raises them to life? And the saints say, is he really saved? We remember him when he was in the grave. We remember him in his sick condition. We remember how he smelled. Come on. We remember what he was. Is he really saved? And Jesus said, loose him. And let him go. And I believe if we had more of a ministry of bringing deliverance and loosening those who Jesus has already life, the Lazarus in this world would come to life. We've had more people who've come into the house of God and nobody took notice of them and they were seeking God because we remember their condition. They were an alcoholic or an abuser or an abusive person or whatever their track record was. And they're crying out for God. They're crying out for deliverance. And Jesus imparts his life. Perhaps they prayed with someone and asked God into their heart and life. He brings them to the house of God. He brings them to the people of God. And we wrap our robes around ourselves and say, is he really saved? How did he get in here? Don't he know this is a church? Come on. You know what I'm talking about. But Jesus said to the saints, loose him and let him go. But beyond that loosening, beloved, which we all need to experience ongoing, there has to be this release from all of the claims. Jesus anticipated that someone would try to stop this coat, even though it was loose, from going on its purpose in God. Hear me, saints. Jesus anticipated that once this coat was loose, something would come to hinder it from going all the way with God. And this coat had to be released from all other claims. And I want to suggest to you this morning that if you're going to experience the fullness of God, the full joy of full surrender, you are going to have to be released from all other claims in your life if you're going to fulfill what God has in mind in this hour. And I want to share with you, if you remember the story of, of Rebecca, uh, uh, God uh, uh, had Abraham, who was a picture of God the Father, send his servant who wasn't named to get a bride for Isaac. You remember that story? Beautiful picture of what God is doing in this hour. 
Abraham, picture of God the Father. The unnamed servant, picture of the Holy Spirit. Isaac, the beloved son, the promised son, the son who was raised back in tight unto life. Abraham said, I've got to find a bride for my son. Sends the servant down among his relatives. The bride came from within, from among his relatives. Are you out there? And when, when the servant comes and he finds Rebecca, he prayed and said, Oh, Lord, make my venture prosperous. Help me know who's the one for Isaac. He gave unto the family gifts. Gave gifts to them. You read, I think, is there in Genesis 24. Gave gifts to all of the family, but unto Rebekah, he not only gave gifts, he gave, as it were, a double portion of everything he'd given to everybody else. And he put the ring upon her, and the thing was a ring in the nose, which was a custom then, a betrothal or whatever, and the uh, jewelry around. He gave her, he gave her more than he'd given the others. Now he says, oh, let me be on my way. I found a bride for Isaac. But Laban says, now wait, 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 wait a minute. Let's ask the girl even if she wants to go. Why don't you stay a little longer? He said, no, let me be on my way. I found the bride for Isaac. Let me be on my errand. Let me, let me be about my master's bidding. I found this one. They said, let us ask the girl what she wants to do. You remember that? And they said unto, you, then unto her, will you go? And she said, I'll go. She had to be released from all of the claims. There had to be a release from all of the claims. Do you hear me this morning? If she was going to be the bride for Isaac, if she was going to be the bride for the promised son, if she was going to be the one in whom Abraham had sent the servant into the world for, she was going to have to be released from all of the claim, though she was found, though she had the gifts. Come on. She was moving in the power of the Spirit. There was a dynamic in her life. Are you out there? But she had to be released from all of the claims that she was going to go all the way to find him, to, 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 to be married to him whom she'd never seen. And how do you know Peter says we love him whom we've never seen in this hour? Amen. I'm talking about the joy of full surrender. And there's going to have to be a release from all of the claims. I want you to see this again. Psalm 45. Psalm 45. I want you to see this truth, please. If we're going to understand the joy of full surrender it isn't just a, a finding, a release, and a deliverance in our life. We're going to have to be released from other claims. Psalm 45. And we read in verse 9, kings, The king's daughters are among thy noble ladies. Psalm 45, 9. The king's daughters are among thy noble ladies. And at thy right hand stands the queen in gold from Ophir. Now notice verse 10 and 11. Listen, O daughter... Give attention and incline your ear. Watch this. Forget your people and your father's house. Then the king, when? When? Then the king will desire your beauty because he is your Lord. Bow down to him. How many you see that she had to be, if she wanted to be the bride to the king, if she wanted to be the, the, the one in whom his desire was, she had to be released from all of the claims. Listen, he says, even though she was among the daughters, come on, he speaks to this one, listen, O daughter, give attention, incline your ear, and God is saying to you and I, I want a people who have an ear to hear what I'm saying, forget your people, forget your father's house, then, then the king will desire your beauty, and because he is your Lord, bow down to him. Now watch this in verse 13. The king's daughter is all glorious, where? Not without. You notice in verse 9, he describes the queen standing in gold. In verse 14, he says the queen's daughter is glorious within, and her clothing are interwoven with gold. How many of you see a transformation there? Something has happened between what was the adornment without, come on, and now there is a transformation within. And it didn't take place until there was a forgetting, there was a release from all of the claims. Forget your people, forget your father's house. Then Jesus said, if any man wants to follow me, he's got to, he's got to leave his family and mother and, and come on. If he's going to follow me, there's going to have to be a release from all of the claims. But only you can do that. Rebecca had to make the choice, I'll go. The daughter here, who's potentially uh, going to be the queen, had to decide whether she was willing to forget and release and go on. And each and every one of us, we have opportunities every day of our life to decide, will we go? 
Amen. And what happens, beloved, and it will only happen in that way. What happens is the glory that seemed to be the dawning without, suddenly there comes a transformation within. Character. And the, and the glory of the Lord our God begins to be revealed from within. Hmm? Jesus, as he stood on the Mount of Transfiguration, and he was changed, his garments were changed, and the, 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 the Greek implies in that transformation. And for each and every one of us, beloved, when we say, Lord, not only do I want to be free from habits and sin and bondage, but, Lord, I'm willing to be released from those things which have claimed my attention, claimed my time, claimed my energy, those things which have not been effective and for your glory and honor. I'm willing to be released from those things because I want the glory of the Lord and a transformation that, that fully fits me for the King's, the king's uh, purposes and desires. Are you there? This coat had to be released from all of the claims. All right? Then something that's quite interesting here, verse 7. Please be aware when there is this sense of being set free, being released from all of the claims, don't forget the purpose for which you were released. Hello? Verse 7 says, come on, read it with me. And they brought the coat to Jesus. Let's say that again like we believe it. And they brought the coat to Jesus. One of the most fascinating things that I've seen in the body of Christ, Jesus sets us free, people get set free, and then they go and do their own thing. Don't forget that when God sets you free, He sets you free for a purpose. He sets you free from those things which have encumbered you and bound you and held you over. And the enemy has sidetracked you from the purposes of God. He sets you free for one purpose, that your life might be brought to Jesus. And present it unto him. Isn't that what Romans 12, 1 tells us? Paul speaking to the believer says, I beseech you, I beg of you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your spiritual worship. Which is just your reasonable act of service, one, one particular translation says. And what's going to happen? Now watch this. This is very powerful. And this is why many of us never get around to discovering God's will for our life. He says, if we'll do that, if we'll offer our body, if we'll present our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto Him, come on. How I many know oh, God doesn't want left, one hoof left behind? Come on. That's what, that's what Moses said, not one hoof left behind. When we come out of Egypt, we're coming out all the way with our children and everything. And we've got to have that determination, not one hoof left behind in the world. When we present ourselves unto God, Romans 2 says that by the renewing of your mind... There's going to be a transformation by the renewing of your mind, and you're going to know what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, have you ever contemplated, beloved, not merely is he saying there that you're going to come to understand what the will of God is, but when you present yourself in that way, wholly, totally, un, un, no, no qualifications to God, then not only are you going to discover the good, the acceptable, the perfect will of God, but you will become, you will prove what the good will of God is. You will prove what the perfect will of God is. And I believe the world is waiting for a demonstration of what God's will is. If they can see it in a people, I believe they'll happily run to Jesus. Oh, hallelujah, this is exciting to me. They brought it to Jesus, and they put their garments on it. Why did they bring it to Jesus? That he might sit upon it. Profound thought, isn't it? Why was this coat ever, coat ever brought to Jesus? That he might sit upon it. May I say that Jesus needed this coat so his feet did not touch the ground? This coat was brought to Jesus to lift him up. Are you out there? Why has my life been presented to Jesus? What does Jesus want of my life? If I be lifted up. Come on. I'll draw all men unto me. And we read right after that, when they laid this garment upon him, something began to happen. 
People, at least in Bethany, began to recognize who he was, and they began to cry out in verse 9, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David, Hosanna in the highest, come on, because he, Jesus had the instrument that he needed to be lifted up, that he might ride forth, and these people recognized him for who he was, and began to give him the glory and the honor and the worship that was due his name. Now, there's something I've got to warn you about, though. Wouldn't it have been very ridiculous? Don't you think it would have been very strange if this colt had the garments put upon him? And he began to hear the acclamates and hear the praise and the worship and the acclamations. Suddenly think, oh, praise God, they finally recognize my importance. <laughs> Praise God, they finally recognized who I am. I'm somebody. <laughs> How many of you know that by the time those coats and everything got thrown around, uh, garments got put upon that coat, probably nothing but the little head and the little ears stuck up anyway? How many of you know today that in the body of Christ, we've got a lot of people who mistake their purpose in God? How many of you know that one of the problems we have today is that we forget who's on the float. Beloved, God doesn't mind using you and me if we don't forget who's on the float. Sometimes, many people, and we've seen it, we've made a jackass of ourselves thinking that the worship belonged to us and the glory and the acclamation and oh, how wonderful I am. My psychological moment has arrived. Are you there? I believe if we can remember who's on top. Come on. You see, because otherwise he'll have to find another coat. Because he's going to be lifted up. Amen. And if he's lifted up, everything else has to be put down. If he increases, then I've got to decrease. Amen. And when I recognize that the joy of full surrender is so that he might be lifted up, so that it might not only be to the, to the glory of his grace, but to the praise of his glory. Did you read that in Ephesians? He starts off by saying that the promises and the privileges that we have in God are for the, the uh, uh, glory of His grace. And then he turns around and says that it might be to the praise of His glory. And if we can take that attitude that God is allowing His grace to be revealed in our lives, and the dynamic and the power and the deliverance and the salvation and the wonderful things that we're seeing and yet we'll see more, but, beloved, we've got to remember that our lives are to be hid in Christ, in God. Amen. That he might be lifted up. Now, it's one other thing here I think that we need to understand, too. This was not the so-called triumphant entry into Jerusalem. Hmm? This happened outside Jerusalem. What am I saying here? Jesus, to fulfill prophecy, rode upon this colt. The Jews inspected their king, their Messiah, to come riding in, not on a colt, but on a horse. A beast of conquest and conquering, overcoming. But it wasn't time at that time for Jesus to reveal himself to come as the Messiah. I mean, he did come to them. They didn't receive him. As a matter of fact, they crucified him. By the time they got into Jerusalem, you read the other translation, uh, the other uh, Gospels, and you discover when they saw what was happening outside the city, that the Jewish and the religious people said, let's kill him. He's getting too much popularity. Let's do away with him. And Jesus, to fulfill prophecy, rode upon this lowly beast. Because it was not his time at that time to come as a conquering king, but he came as a paschal lamb. And that's the reason you read in Luke chapter 24 that those men who were on the road to Emmaus, seven miles outside of Jerusalem, after Jesus had died, they were confused. They were downcast. They didn't know what to do. And often they do what we do. When we don't understand the purposes of God, and when we don't understand what the dealings of God were about, and when we don't understand what the suffering was about, we move away from the place of what we call our tragedy because I've got to get away from the scene of action. And as they were walking along the way, Jesus starts walking along with them. 
Don't move too quickly from the scene, the scene of your crisis. Hmm? Because along the way at the scene of your crisis, the Christ will be revealed. Only Jesus could tell them what it meant. Only Jesus could answer the longing and the desire and the cry of their heart for understanding. And as he walked through along the way, you know there in Luke 24, he listened to them talking. And he said, what are you talking about? I, I like this. Jesus is real cool. <laughs> what are you talking about? He knew already. Don't you know he knew their heart? They said, where have you been? Don't you know what's happened? How we had hoped that this would be the one. We'd hoped that this would be the one that would bring in the kingdom, and yet they put him on a cross and crucified him. And the Bible says Jesus began to speak to them, and because it was night, they invited him in. Hmm? He acted as if he was going to go on a little further, but they said, come stay with us, for the night is at hand. Beloved, if there's anything we need in this hour, we need Jesus in the midst of the darkness all around us. Amen. For David said, when the, when the, when the darkness is all around me, the Lord shall be a light unto me. And, that, and though he acted as if he would gone on a little further, they invited him in and said, come on in, for the night's at hand. And as he broke bread unto them, before them, their eyes were open. They saw him. You read the scripture. He opened the book unto them. He explained from the scriptures. Hmm? He, di he didn't try to address their head. He dealt with their heart. How I many you know the word of God deals with our heart? Thy word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Amen? And he dealt with the sin of doubt and the sin of unbelief and their fears by the word of God. And he began to open the book and he began from the beginning... From the prophets and the Psalms, and he opened the book, and he showed them in the Psalms how it was necessary that the Christ should suffer first, and then enter into his glory. Peter picks up on this later in his, in his writings, and he says first concerning the sufferings of Christ, and then entering into his glory. Hmm? And when they got that revelation, you know what happened? They didn't even stay the night. The Bible says they got up and they headed back toward Jerusalem to find their brother and, and encourage them with the word of the Lord, that we've seen the Lord. And you won't stay in your night situation. You won't stay in your dark situation. When you get a revelation of who he is and what he's up to, you won't stay in that place of Emmaus. It might seem far away, but I'll tell you, the purposes of God in, in, in giving you the, the understanding is so that you might go back to your place of crisis and where there's others who too are confused and being misled and being drawn away and being deceived, they went and encouraged the brother and shared with them those things which he shared with them. Why did God bring you here? Why did you come to these camp meetings? Come on. If you'll be honest, there were some things you knew you needed to be set free from, things that you wanted God to release you into. But I want you to know he sets you free that you might go to set others free. Don't forget. He brings us to those places where he comes alongside and opens the book. That we might go back and find our brethren and gather those who have been scattered. And gather those who are out of place. And gather those who have been burnt and hurt and broken and bruised. And bind up their wounds and pour in the oil and the wine. Put them on our beast. Let them ride a little while. Take them to the end, if need be. Pay the expense and see that they come to a full restoration. Come into all that God has intended for them. Hmm? Are you ready for that? Because, beloved, the real truth of the matter is, and Paul gives us the revelation, even as Jesus, in his first coming, was willing to ride upon this lowly beast because he was going to a place of suffering first, you and I must be willing to ride in a lowly place, a humble place, to suffer if need be with him, if we're going to reign with him. Because I come to the book of the Revelation, and I find one who's no longer riding on a coat, but he's riding on a horse, and his name is faithful and true, and there are some who are also riding on a horse with him. They're not riding on a coat behind him. Come on. They've overcome. They've entered into his sufferings, and they're also going to enter into his glory. And if we're willing to suffer with him, the Bible says we'll also reign with him. Come on. 
We've got to be willing to be like this, this little colt. Where are you, you this morning in God? Can you say like this colt that your life is at the door? Come on in, Lord Jesus. I'm standing at a place of readiness. I want to be used of you. I want to hear what you're saying. The Lord uttered his voice, and great was the company of those who proclaimed it. Are you in a position where you hear what God is saying? And are you ready to move with that word? Hmm? Have you come to the place that you're willing to stand in the road? Become conspicuous. Become foolish if need be. That others might not just go on their way to hell without any others saying, This is the way. Come on. Let's walk in it. Are you willing to get in their way? Are you willing to do the uncomfortable? Hmm? The inconvenient? Are you willing to lift your voice above the noise and the confusion of the world around you? And say, come on, I've heard a word from God. Let me tell you about a man that sent me free. Yeah. Somebody said the best thing that each of us could ever realize is that we're all bums. One bum telling another bum where to get bread. Amen? Come on. God's loosened for a purpose. What am I willing to be released from other claims? Hmm? See, the enemy is very, very sly and subtle. He'll keep you wrapped up in financial stuff, marital stuff, family stuff, anything to keep you from doing the will of God. But if you'll cast your care upon him, come on. Come on. Casting all our care upon him, knowing that he cares for us. If we'll seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all these other things, come on. If you honor God, God will honor you. You stand for Him, He'll stand for you. You take on the burdens of the Lord, He'll take on your burdens. How about, have you had some garments put on you lately? Have you seen a divine transformation? I was talking to a brother earlier of how God works with us. God never takes anything out of our life, but that He gives us a divine substitute. When He comes to release you and set you free from bondages and habits and hang-ups and fears and, and other things. Beloved, he wants to give you a divine substitute. Come on, we heard it yesterday. He gives us beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garments of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Come on. He became sin who knew no sin that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Everything that God does in our life, beloved, when he takes that thing which is inferior, he gives us something superior. Put the garments upon them. Hallelujah. Is our life available? Do we lift up Jesus? I believe it's going to be one of the real keys for discernment in this hour. Give me saints. We're going to hear a lot of things coming across as truth. We're going to hear a lot of things coming forth as the word of the Lord. But the question is, who's on the float? When it's all said and done, was Jesus lifted up higher? Did I get a greater glimpse of Jesus? Did the light of the glory of God shine out in the face of Jesus Christ? And no matter how good it sounds, if Jesus was not lifted up and exalted, then the Spirit of God was not in it. It was another spirit. Come on. We've got to ask ourselves who's on the float. Because he's going to be lifted up in this hour. He's going to draw all men unto himself. And then are we willing to suffer a little while with him? Paul said, for I recognize that this present suffering, you know, beaten three times, 39 stripes, shipwrecked twice, fought with wild beasts in Ephesus, night and the day in the deep, imprisoned, forsaken, but not forgotten, crushed, he said, as it were, perplexed, knocked down, but not defeated. Come on. Amen. We're willing to suffer with him for a little while. This momentary, momentary suffering. He said, I recognize this momentary suffering isn't worthy to be compared with the glory that shall follow. Amen. God's looking for people who can see things from his way, from his perspective. Are you down looking up? Are you up looking down? He was a little different, didn't it? When we see things his way. Amen? We're willing to tarry a little while. We're willing to wait to hear what he will say unto me. And if we'll share in the sufferings, 
will enter into his glory. Let's stand together in the presence of the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Thank you, Father God. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Hallelujah. I really believe God just wants to use this word as a real capstone for all the good things he's done in our lives this weekend. I really believe God wants to use each and every one of you. You are significant in God. No two of us are alike. No two snowflakes are alike. God will use your personality. God will use your gifting. God will use your ability. If you're willing to be like that code and say, Lord, I'm available. I'm willing. Make me, Lord God, your instrument by which you are lifted up and exalted. Amen. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we do come. Oh God, we come once again hearing your challenge. I hear your challenge once again afresh. Lord, I hear your challenge, Lord God, to be willing to be a fool for you, Lord God, in this hour. All but to see men and women brought to Jesus Christ. To see your house full. For you said, go ye to the hedges and the highways and the byways. Compel them to come in. My house is going to be full. Oh, Jesus, we ask in this hour that you'll make us those who do go to the hedges and the highways and the byways. Lord, you'll help us to see what you see and hear the cry of the perishing. Rescue the dying. Cause those, Lord God, who are in defeat and downcast and, and Lord, bound over, that will come with a life-giving word and loose them. Set them free in the name of Jesus. Oh, God, that we bind up the brokenhearted. Set the captives free. Bring deliverance, O oh God. We heard yesterday the Spirit of the Lord is upon us because you've anointed us. Oh, God, you only give the Holy Spirit to those who obey you. So, Father, we ask not only for an increase of the anointing of God upon our lives, but, Lord, we ask for immediate obedience. We recognize that obedience, if it isn't immediate, it isn't obedience. Lord, we recognize that Saul gave you half-hearted obedience and you counted it as witchcraft, rebellion. Father... Obedience, if it isn't total, it is it isn't obedience. And then, Lord, we saw how you judged the people because they weren't willing to be joyful. Obedience, if it isn't joyful, isn't obedience. You said because we wouldn't worship you with joy. Therefore, Lord God, your judgment came upon. Us. Lord, help us to be a joyful people. It doesn't spring from our circumstances. Happiness often is tied with happenings. Lord, joy. Only springs from you. Make the joy of the Lord our strength, Father, as we go from here. Father, may we be a people of joy. Or we reminded how Spurgeon said it's easier to catch flies with honey than with vinegar. Make us a joyful people, Lord. Let the joy of the Lord be our strength and our portion, O oh God. Father, send us forth from this place, but not from your presence, we pray. In Jesus' name, all God's people said. Amen. This is the end of this message. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home.